I might not be a high mage, but I can certainly forge ahead and talk about one. Cheers. Welcome back, everybody, to me. Not only talking about a book, it's been a while, but me actually talking about a Malazan book, which has been even longer. And um, I'm really happy to do that, because today we're going to talk about The Forge of the High Mage by Ian Cameron Esselmont, um, the next book in the Path to Ascendancy series, or at least following after the first Path to Ascendancy trilogy, depending on how these things are measured or whatever. So, um, that's what we're going to do today. I'll give a quick synopsis, which will be spoiler-free, and telling you all to go and read it, and then we'll go into, like, a discussion. I don't feel like a spoiler-free review of a fourth book in a series makes a lot of sense, but, you know, um, in case you're waiting for it because of weird releases and stuff like that, which I assume happens as well. Um, let me flaunt my privilege and talk about it, and then um, you can go to the rest. I'll probably not actually, you know, spoil too much of individual plot lines or anything like that in the discussion, because I want to look at themes, but it may happen. So be forewarned. And um, now let's look at uh, a quick synopsis of why you definitely need to read this book, which you do. All right, <clears throat> let's do that. All right, it's the fourth book in the Path to Ascendancy series, so it is a Malazan book looking at the rise of the Malazan Empire, and it takes place a couple of years, possibly a decade, I'm not quite sure because I really don't care about timelines and stuff like that, um, after Kalanvet's reach, and, and it deals with, with the conquest of Falar. I guess so much is possible to know from the back cover as well. Um, the point is, we don't learn more about, you know, the conquest of Quintali, whatever goes on with the Crimson Guard at the time, we don't get those kind of things. But um, we start with, you know, the conquest of Corel going sour and the Malazan Empire deciding to do something else. And then we follow three main plot lines, sort of one on Falar, one of an army sent out to Falar, and one of a fleet sent out to Falar. And then we follow these, like, three main plot lines. We meet a lot of people that we've met before. We meet some people that we haven't met before in the Path to Ascendancy. We meet some people that we have met at the beginning of Path to Ascendancy that come back. Um, we see a lot of build-up and... Um, for stuff that goes down in the Malazan Book of the Fallen or the novels of the Malazan Empire. It does all of that, but beyond all of it, it is just another really good Cam Aslamont book with all the things you come to expect. It's got all the big fireworks, it's got great sea and ship action, and it's got, well, a lot of detailed descriptions, cultures, all the good stuff, and the prose has gotten even better than it was before, like with the last part of the sentence, which, you know, like the descriptions work really well in this one. There's a bunch of like just descriptions of emotions or something that just like worked so well this time. I really appreciated that. I um, once again enjoyed having um, the inner perspective of some characters that I really hated before, um, and I do understand them now better now, some of them, some not so much. We will see. Um, point is, it's a great book. It's not that long. It's got all the Malazan stuff you want, so go and read it. Um, yeah, and read, obviously, um, uh, Path to Ascendancy um, before that, which, you know, why haven't you if you haven't? Anyway, that's my recommendation. It's got um, all the stars that I never give because I don't give stars and rate anything, but go and read a book. It's great. And now let's talk about themes and why they're good and why they're so fantastic. All right. Great that you've read the book. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't, well, this is spoilerish territory. Deal with the consequences. Let's talk about um, Forty of the High Mage and look at some of the major themes, how they are explored, how they connect to the larger Malazan universe, and to the things that um, Cam Esselmont in particular tends to look at, and then we'll go through those. There's one large thing, which is imperialism, colonialism, post-colonialism, cultural appropriation, possibly, and how those kind of things interact. That's one large topic that we always see in the Malazan universe. We have seen it with the Malazan Book of the Fallen several times. We have seen it in the novels of the Malazan Empire a bunch of times. Obviously, one of them being uh, Blood and Bone, another one being Assail. It's one theme that uh, Cam Esselmont tends to look at, how... Um, 
well, more technologically advanced cultures tend to push aside um, less technologically advanced cultures uh, without any regard for them. And that's, you know, probably the past in archaeology and anthropology that kind of gives you that outlook because it keeps happening. The question is, what you know, how to deal with that. And um, that's a big theme once again, and I really appreciate the way it does this. There will be slight spoilers in this part also when we talk about um, that go to Stonewielder, because there's a connection here that I think is very powerful in a way. I think you can read Forge of the High Mage as like a mirror image, or at least a further exploration of themes that came up in Stonewielder already. And that is, I mean, Obviously, from like a very far away perspective, it's, yeah, those are like island nations with a um, very specific local faith that has a large control over the island nation. And, and we have an external empire, in both cases the Malazans, trying to conquer these places. And the question is like, how does that work? And why does one of those conquests work and why does the other not? And looking at these kind of things, there's another layer to that because both of these island kingdoms, as we come to know, um, that religion have been conquered before, because, you know, that's how the world works. Usually um, it's one conquest after the other. Um, and in this case, um, this also comes up in a way. And it does also, once again, um, lead to um, the question of... Um, and this is where sort of like cultural appropriation comes in. There's also like a religious dimension in there that I really appreciate it, but that's sort of what I want to look at first. So let's let's look at what happened in... Uh, Falar. There was an original population of dark-haired Falari, and then the red-haired Falari conquered them and took over their religion because the original people were beloved of male, and they had that um, male um, worship, and male gave them a specific power, that being, you know, the way to summon the Jistal, which is a huge tsunami at the end of the day. And when the um, foreign invaders, the red-haired um, guys, came over, they appropriated that religion with that power, which is what, you know, was sort of handled in the in the prologue, in a way. And they took that power away from the original inhabitants by still, you know, enslaving them and suffer, you know, sacrificing their blood, because it's still their blood that is sort of, sort of maybe needed to keep that ritual thing going. So there is something that you can read as, if you want to, as cultural appropriation um, by force. And after that, they took um, control of the island and made it basically a theocracy, exploiting the population. And there is a, with the threat of using that power against other islands and, you know, being massive dickheads. Um, the other part is there is a lack of an external threat all the way because they have this superpower, which they never use. Um, and no one has tried to conquer Falar for a long time. So... While in theory, the priests of male of the Gistal cult have the power to save or sort of the protectors of the country, what they're running is a protection racket in a very criminal way. And um, yeah, that doesn't make people happy, which makes it easier to, you know, divide and conquer that place. Now, if you compare that to what's going on in Corel, you have um, at the beginning of Stonewielder, spoilers for the prologue of Stonewielder, you see how, um, well, refugees conquer um, an island and find the goddess there, take on their her religion, um, start serving, serving here. And, well, becoming the storm guard, uh, serving at the storm wall. So what's going on there? On the one hand... Um, the religion of the storm god is unique to the storm god. It's not that they appropriate the power of something that happened before or culturally appropriated. They just, well, they just conquer and take over the place. Um, the other part is there is an external threat. The storm riders are a very, well, quantifiable threat. And the storm god, at least as far as we can see and tell at the beginning of Stonewielder, <coughs> Yeah, they use prisoners and stuff like that, and they expect a tribute of, um, well, fighters in some way for their defense, but that's all they do. They don't necessarily harshly interfere. I mean, they keep down other religions, but that's, that's all the control they levy. They are not running a protection racket in, a, in the way that the Gistal cult is running, and that makes it much more difficult to take over that country because um, the population 
is, well, more coherent in that regard and does support, up to a point at least, um, the, um, the elite that is in power, that religious elite that is in power. And uh, that's certainly um, one of the big differences here. But also, once again, we, in both cases, we have these like several layers of <clears throat> conquests or settlements um, that uh, take over or bring their own faith and, um, you know, build these societies. Now, that is obviously an interesting aspect, because at the end of the day, that's also what the Malazan Empire is doing. It's conquering places. It seems not to actually bring its own religions, at least not so far. If you move far away in the future, we see new cults springing up, but they are not necessarily state-controlled in that way. As far as we know, well, the Malazan Empire does not necessarily want its, you know, different cults. We, we hear all about, you know, crushing of the, of the Boer cult and stuff like that, but... In the most part, it seems to be a secular empire in that regard, which does obviously help when you have local faiths that are in some way or other important. So that, that does definitely help um, the conquest and settlement, um, the imperial amb ambitions of the Malazan Empire. Not to say that that better, I'm just saying that's why they might be more successful in some cases, at least. Still, yeah, in, in this case, there's a, that's why I said there's like a parallel between Stonewielder and um, uh, Forge of the High Mage. However, there's obviously more. The question then, because of, the question that comes to that is, once again, the question of culture and who the country belongs to and so forth. Because, obviously, when the pirates um, under um, the fleet command of Kalanved and uh, uh, show up, they just raid and rape and move away. Uh, or, you know, try to settle, but they do that in that uncoordinated um, way. And obviously the inhabitants fight back uh, because, you know, no one likes to be conquered. Um, however, what then happens is obviously that um, Kalimbed takes over the whole place by ridding them from, you know, the threat of the Gistal on the one hand, which has already, you know, not exactly made a lot of friends. Um, we see that, obviously, at the beginning with Malik Rel taking over uh, that um, wonderful mansion for himself, because, you know, um, he can, because he's in power. Um, so we see how the Malazan way of taking over um, by um, supporting the local inhabitants against a perceived tyranny, in this case, those pirates that will obviously be eradicated at the end of Forge of the Iron Age, and supporting them against the... Um, local power structure, the local elite, because usually, you know, <laughs> the lower classes tend to not like the elites. It's um, it's not something, well, I mean, Marx has said it, and it's pretty much true. So going in there and doing that does make the conquest, at the end of the day, much less of an actual perceived conquest. It's more like swooping in to help and then taking over with a very light hand and, you know, so forth. By while leaving the local culture at least somewhat alive. And we'll go back to this culture question in a moment. Because, of course, there's another arm where this question is raised, and that is the whole conversation around the Jack and Ulara. First of all, cool to see Bear Jack as well. That's uh, nice. Um... Cool to see Ulara again as now a high priestess of the Jack. That was a lot of fun, having seeing her have her like actual tender moments with a dancer. I also really appreciated that. It's you know, that was really nice. Um, but beyond that, the Jack are another one of these like more like less advanced culture. They're like a tribal warrior society, <clears throat> obviously with those more like animal characteristics of their shape-changing built in there, but they're like, a, you know, a tribal warrior society, very similar to what you might see from the Bargast, or, um, yeah, mostly, I guess, like the Bargast in um, later Malaz Book of the Fallen novels, or the All, for example. And they are faced with a coherent army now, which is a problem. So they are obviously... On the, at the beginning, they underestimate the Malazans uh, when they fight on their own terms. They obviously, because they have all these all this knowledge, <clears throat> they succeed. But once the Malazans turn like actually the war machine on, they get slaughtered. And at the end of the and this is like this is sort of where it gets interesting because at the end there's that debate what uh, about the country and Danza goes like yeah but <clears throat> we'll give you this country 
uh, we'll give you this land that you have been living on forever. We'll give you that. And Ulara is like, that's not yours to give. And, and I think this is important as like the third part of this discussion, because, you know, questions of land back or <clears throat> giving to yeah, giving reservations to Native Americans, for example, for Native inhabitants, giving them places, the, the sheer hubris of someone like, I'll give you this land. Australia is another place where that happens a lot, right? Seeing that played out and having someone stand up, I was like, no. It, the only reason you can do this right now is because you took it by force. And it's important to keep that that part in there because the gesture of giving land sounds grand and sounds like positive, but it's not. It's it's not because the injustice lay before that and I, I, and I do appreciate the way um these like different approaches to um different places are played out in this book. I, I do really appreciate that. And it, and it gets mirrored in, uh, you know, other parts when we talk about um, these elder races that tend to, look, you know, <laughs> show up. This was like the, the sort of like global level of what we talked about. Now let's talk about individuals for a moment and then move on to stuff like mental health and shit like that. You can see the question of cultural appropriation comes up again. Almost. Or in this case, enslavement, because the, the other storyline of Singer taking over <coughs> control of the mountain of the Kachin Chimal, that's enslavement of a different group. That, it's not necessarily cultural appropri appropriation, but it is certainly a enslavement taking over of these tools. <coughs> now we have, you know, a lot of places in the world where people come and find local people, take their knowledge, and then just... <coughs> you know, patented it as medicine, for example, stuff like that. Um, so that cultural appropriation kind of thing happens um, in that regard, or like exploitation happens in our world. In a way, it is mirrored by the uh, Gistol priests taking over the Gistol from the original inhabitants or like the older inhabitants of the Falaran Islands. We see it in a more explicit personal level with Singer just showing up and controlling and enslaving an entire um, swarm of Kachin Jamal to take over that thing for his personal vengeance. <clears throat> um, there's a second la level, of course, there, which is um, technology versus nature, which we'll uh, see later on how that ends up. But I just wanted to point out that we, we're now at that personal level where these ideas um, once again spring up. And I found that very, very interesting because that question of the individual towards um, other people that respect that is at the basis of this is another level that we find here because even when he has his um, human, um, the Jack Hood singer, when he has his human prisoner, so to speak, um, of that crew, he does disrespect them as well. He does not in any way, um, you know, take them seriously because he thinks himself more powerful, better than them. And that, that idea of force versus, like might versus right, is at the core of this book in so many ways. And that's where, where I want to leave that for now and go and talk about um, Teishren and uh, mental health. Because Teishren does mirror Singer in some ways. And I've said this before, Teishren is a fantastic character. I've, l I've learned to at least appreciate him much more through the novels of Cam Asselman with all these insights in him. And this is, I mean, this is the Forge of the High Mage. This is where Teishren actually begins to become the high mage, and that that part I do really appreciate. So let's look at what happens there. So Teishren begins by being the very rational person that we, intellectual person that we've come to know from the first path to ascendancy novels. Um, <clears throat> I'm I'm going to be careful here because I have not been diagnosed with autism, but in some ways. I feel that you can read Teishren as a um, portrayal of or representation of someone who is sort of on that spectrum, who is sort of neurodivergent. Um, but I don't want to make that claim because it's obviously not made in the book, but it feels to me as an outsider like that. 
However, what we see in this book is how Tai Shren, who has lived in this way, ha slowly learned through like life experience, all kinds of other things, starting to take responsibility and learning respect for the people underneath him. And I feel the way this is done is absolutely brilliant. We start with Tayshun just not understanding it and then slowly gaining respect. And there's a level in there that I personally am really thankful is in there, which is when Tayshun has his first, like, Marines coming with him. He feels he has to save them, he has to protect them, he has to leave them behind because he's going into danger which they will not be able to survive and so forth. And as someone who has, you know, a disability, um, the idea that someone else tells you, you can't do this, this is too dangerous for you, and so forth. Um, that The idea that that is taking away agency from someone else and power to decide to willingly go into danger or whatever, that that level of arrogance that is sort of built in, even if it comes from like a good place, when they're like, yeah, I don't want to see those people die, so I'm going to do this on my own. But the fact that this is actually... That this causes harm because you decide, you take over the power to decide for someone else. The way that slowly Teishren figures that out, out, or, uh, out over the entire like story, I felt was like a really powerful development. <laughs> Obviously, at the other hand, we have uh, the first seeds being planted by um, Hairlock against uh, Nightchill, which will obviously end up at the beginning of... Um, Gardens of the Moon, I guess, <clears throat> and these kind of ideas of power struggles take starting to take place in in the Malazan Empire. We see Tapa show up. We see Topper and Dancer almost fighting. Um, we have all these elements in there, and how Teishren tries to navigate that because Teishren doesn't want to play these games. It's it's not his interest. He's interested in magic and stability, and that's all it is, <clears throat> basically for him. I think that part. Um, was fun, but like the main interest for me with Tay Shren is how he slowly realizes that he as a person has to have morals as well as intellect and has to have, and that morals do have an intuitive, um, well, <clears throat> part to them obviously in, in that case. It's when he has a conversation with her, I was like, magic comes from the gut. It's not pure intellectual um, um, exercise. And that is obviously a very important question, right? You look at it and it's like, yeah, that's that's something we tend to forget in a lot of places, especially when we do science. Like, the intellectual challenge might be challenging, but thinking about the consequences um, of intellectual challenges often gets put to the wayside. Ethics comes afterwards. And that feeds back, and this is what I like so much about it, this feeds back to... Um, <coughs> The Kachin Chimal, they are alien. They use technology. Um, they use this technology to just basically drive, uh, well, fly a combine harvester over the country, destroy the country underneath, eat everything up they find, uh, because they don't care. They're pure intellect. They're pure intellect and they're pure technology, which makes them obviously susceptible to... Um, a lot of things, uh, because once you know the rules of technology, you can exploit it, which is exactly what, Sin what Singer does um, in that case. And it's where Teishren differs, because he does, at some point, realize, well, ethics and stuff like that, and respect for other people. And I think there's a lesson in there that goes way beyond, um, you know, just this being a cool story, which is exactly that, that we need to be aware of both these um, forces in like intellect and um, intuition, if you will, or <clears throat> intellect and heart or morals, whatever you want to call it, empathy and compassion, basically, <laughs> um, and how they need to work in tandem and how they, that conversation is a continual, is a continual um, struggle, which you can tie back between, you know, the um, the conflict between the Malazans and uh, say the Crimson Guard. The Crimson Guard makes this vow <clears throat> which is mostly driven by emotion, and that emotion might be justified. <laughs> but um, that doesn't help, whereas the Malazan Conquest is mostly pure intellect. They're, they're, it may be mad intellect in the case of Kellenberg, we don't know, but it, it's mostly intellect. But in situations of actual threat, we need to have these things work in tandem, which is why we have, um, well... 
not necessarily really working together, but we have situations where, in this book, where obviously the Crimson Guard and the Malazans work together, in this case, some of those, because, yeah, it's not one side, it is two sides of, of that coin that make us human, in a way. And all of that obviously comes ahead at the end with the final question of nature versus technology, because you can obviously use nature as a stand-in for that more um, intuitive, emotional, whatever you want to call it, force. And you can use technology as um, the stand-in for uh, rationality and pure intellect. And the symbol of that huge wave that is comes from love, that comes from love of male for his children and so forth, that comes from love against that technology-driven mountain. That conflict, that, that does give a very impressive image, impressive metaphor for that whole conflict. And I do appreciate the powerful the power of that image. Um, and the message is also, once again, very clear. <laughs> it's like, at the end of the day, nature will win. Nature will always win, which, you know, it's also a nice callback to the ending of uh, The God Is Not Willing, in that all of the people on the ground, Crimson Guard, Jack, um, Malazans, all sort of work together to escape that flood. And that, you know, that message might be important in our current situations where um, those kind of floods tend to be more likely, <laughs> and technology alone will not be able to save us from that. It needs to have other elements as well. I, I do like that. I just really, really appreciated that. Um, so, those are some of the large themes that I really liked. Um, I haven't talked much about the plot line on the sea, because while it is fun, it just mirrors these others in a lot of ways, where you have, like, intellect, um, you have chaos with the sailing ships. I did really, really enjoy having the twins again. Seriously, Janelle and Jenna? What, I think that's their names, I keep forgetting. Are, like, such a good, like, I like the way they are, like, living together, helping each other, sharing their life, which we know they literally do after um, Kamabet's reach. And adding more dimensions to that makes them... Uh, I feel like... I will feel very different next time I read Return to the Crim of the Crimson Guard, is what I'm saying here. Um, then, of course, the plotline of um, the High Priestess um, um, trying to escape, um, finding those old scrolls again by being or returning to the person that she really wants to be, which is obviously fighting for her country, for her own culture, taking that back by not letting herself be sacrificed, by rather, you know, jumping into that hole by f asserting that, and thus sort of regaining her identity as hi actual high priestess, not just as, like, forced high priestess of male, but actually taking over that role when she meets <laughs> male down in the cave. And can I just say I love the way we find out that his name is Bug? That was really funny. Um, obviously, I, I mean, I I like male in general, so I was just really cool. But the whole idea that of that relationship between um, um, priest and God, or priestess and God in this case, or the divine and the human, if you want, want that, and how those are like interactions, how those bind in both directions, um, that was, you know, just a nice callback. And yeah, see, that's that's how you can have that argument at the end of the day, because um, as high priestess of male after that, she does reassert her own identity. But it, it comes from her. It's not given by, you know, Malik Rel or the current group of the of the of the Gistel priest or anything. It is looking back uh, at what like lies at the core of, of of the identity and reasserting that in a way and taking back that kind of control. Which once again, you know, we've talked about these elements before in this book, and it's it's what makes this book so powerful for me. It's like how you can have these. Um, same questions pop up in all kinds of different like levels of personal all the way up to global scale um, because they are the same questions, the same questions that we always face, which are questions of self-determination versus external forces, the question of like follow our heart or follow our brain, um, follow, well, ideally both together. Th these kind of questions crop up again and again and they drive, <clears throat> they drive that, um, that whole, you know, world, which is like, 
really interesting uh, to me. So all in all, I really love this book. I hope you loved it as well. Um, I hope you took some things out of it. Um, I can't wait for the next Malazan book. It's been so much fun to just go back to this world. <sighs> I feel like another reread coming along. <laughs> I hope I find time for that. Anyway, thanks for watching. Um, if you've watched, read the book, let me know what you thought about it. Um, do like, subscribe, join the Patreon if you feel like it. I do need money. <laughs> I'm poor. <laughs> but beyond all of that, seriously, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.